Thank you very much, Chris. And I am delighted and honoured to be here this morning chairing our first debate session, which I have no doubt will be a really, really engaging one. So before I start by introducing our speakers, let's put the tech to the test and see if we can get you voting on the motion of this debate. The motion for the first debate is intensive farming is good for welfare and sustainability. Now, if you head to the right of your screen, you'll see the polls section um, in the stage section on the Slido tab, and you can either vote to agree or disagree with the motion. So if you head over there and do that now, it will give us a good starter to see where you're all sitting this morning before we hear from our four fantastic speakers and see if that changes as we go through the, the process. So whilst you're voting there, um, I will just introduce the first two of our amazing speakers. And um, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce David Alvis and Dr. Carmen Hubbard. David Alvis is director of the Commercial Farmers Group, a Nuffield Scholar and a fellow at the Institute um, of Agricultural Management. He will propose the motion that intensive farming is good for welfare and sustainability. Carmen will oppose the motion an agricultural economist and a senior lecturer at Newcastle University and also a member of the Animal Welfare Committee. So I've just seen on my screen come up the poll results. Um, interestingly, I think those who are proposing the motion perhaps have a little bit of work on their hands here. We are currently sitting at a, ooh, somewhere between 80 and 90% of people disagreeing that intensive farming is good for animal welfare and sustainability um, and the rest are agreeing. So I will now hand over to the production team to play you the first of our two talks. Good morning uh, ladies and gentlemen and thank you for this opportunity. My name is David Alvis, um, I'm a director of the Commercial Farmers Group and my experience has been 30 years in production agriculture uh, and consultancy with particular focus on the livestock sector and within that the dairy sector. So a lot of my examples within this presentation will be dairy focused. I think to start we need to understand you know what we mean by intensive farming um, and for the, for the purpose of this debate we'll look at it from the point of view that intensive farming is, is a type of agriculture for both crops and plants characterized by high inputs and consequently higher outputs or yields. Um, if we define that down a little bit further to livestock farming, how does that look? It looks at basically keeping large numbers of animals on, on smaller land areas, either by using intensive rotational grazing or potentially um, concentrated feeding operations or CAFOs. But it's important to note, to recognise and to understand that intensive is a relative and it's a dynamic concept. It's moving constantly what's in considered intensive today may not be considered intensive in five or ten years time or five or ten years ago and it's evolving according to best practice um, with regard to what is what is both possible and sustainable but what is absolutely clear and this might be you know sort of slightly counterintuitive agriculture intensification is the foundation of human civilization nothing that we take for granted today the cultural socio-economic or technological norm would have been or could have been possible without the intensification of food production and what does that mean in real in real terms well that means that over time we've seen um, a gradual increase in the price of food throughout human history up until the point at which agriculture started to intensify and that really happened the lot the the what we understand today as intensive agriculture has happened in the last 150 to 200 years, and that has corresponded with a massive and sustained drop in the real price of food. And what does food, food affordability is hugely important because it's a major driver of, of, of quality of life. Um, and that's only really, and, and also peace, because the only time that that's been punctuated in the last 150 years really has been the two world wars of the, of the 20th century. And it's not just you know, an improving quality of life for the developed world. What we've also seen over time is, uh, particularly in the last 30 or 40 years, is a huge number of, or, or a huge reduction in the number of hungry people in the developed world to the point where today famine and, and systemic hunger is essentially now a function of governance failure rather than any of, uh, lack of availability of food. So that begs a question, why has intensive farming become such a pejorative term? And I would argue that that is 
first and foremost a first world problem that, that, that agriculture has become a victim of its own success and that nobody um, argues against um, affordable food from the position of, a, of an empty stomach. Um, secondly, we're seeing an increasing urbanization across all societies, but particularly in, in, in Western, Western societies. And that means an increasing distance, both geographical and generational between consumers and food production. So that this, this lack of, of understanding or knowledge of, of where food comes from. And that's been exacerbated by a failure on, uh, of the industry to communicate contemporary best, best practice. Um, we're being damned by the sins of the past. And I think anybody who understands the industry knows that, that best practice and outcomes today are unrecognizable from where they were 10, 15 years ago, let alone 30 or 40 years ago, where most of the criticism of intensive agriculture began. And finally, um, we are living in an age of the rise of, 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 of the CSO, the lobby group, and the politicization of both the welfare and sustainability agendas. So there's an awful lot of the careers now being built on single issue lobbying, but unfortunately, single issue lobbyists don't have accountability or responsibility to society. And sustainability is, is despite you know, much, much of the publicity we see today, is about more than just the environment. A truly sustainable system, a truly sustainable society needs to take into account not just environmental, but social and economic. Um, well-being and sustainability as well for, for anything to be considered truly sustainable and that social and economic sustainability manifests itself in food affordability food availability to the extent that today it's generally considered that food affordability is a huge driver of peace and therefore you know expensive food is just not an option if we wish to continue to develop a more equitable and safer society uh, for for humanity but welfare is also important. Um, welfare is a fundamental component of sustainability, and welfare is a fundamental is a, of both the economic, the environmental, and the social aspects of it. And there's a, there are moral reasons for understanding and developing animal welfare. And we, but we, again, we need to be clear on how we define it. Welfare being the non, uh, the well-being of non-human animals, particularly under under the care of humans, and that historically has been determined by objective indicators such as longevity, incidence of disease, behavior, physiology, immune suppression, et cetera. And these are, these are fairly straightforward and fairly easy to measure, but over time we've seen a shift away from um, those objective measurements to more subjective measures. And the question I would put is, is that subjective welfare measures, the idea, the concept of a life worth living or a good life, they're a lot harder to, to determine, a lot harder to objectively measure. And is this progress? And, or is this simply pandering to the anthropomorphic sort of nature of modern societies? Because these are often, these, these subjective welfare measures are often more concerned with methods of production than they are with measurable outcomes. And the argument being that, far, that intensive farming is unnatural and therefore fundamentally unable to provide good welfare, whatever that may be. But again, we're looking at you know, a society now distance from food production where powerful anthropomorphic images of animals will cloud people's judgment. And it's always it's very much easier for the world to accept a simple lie than a complex truth when it comes to, to matters that they don't fully understand, particularly something as, as, as complicated as food production. So if we start looking at some of these simple lies that are out there, the, the, the idea that nature knows best, now this might be um, might seem again counterintuitive but it's it, it's not necessarily the truth in fact quite often it's wrong nature nature is a lottery nature is an iterative process and what is natural um if we look at the dog the animal that has been domesticated longer than any other and the one that's probably most familiar um to to, to modern humans um the dog is is our is man's best friend but biologically it's still a wolf it's still the same species and Natural behavior for a wolf is to hunt its prey in packs, but nobody for one moment would suggest that that's how we should allow our dogs to behave. And while we're looking at this, we need to ask ourselves the concept of a good life or a life worth living. Put yourself in the position of the deer. How worth living is that animal's life right now? So nature isn't always necessarily the best arbiter of, of what constitutes a good life. And domestication itself was, was as much a voluntary process on the part of the animals as it was in human beings, that they understood 
that the dependence on humans potentially offered them more or a better life than nature did. And if we look at that for other domesticated food species, like for example, the cow, we have changed that animal fundamentally over the generations, over the centuries since we domesticated its wild ancestors to the point at which the animal is so physiologically and behaviorally different today that the appropriate management for that animal is very different to what might have been appropriate for its wild ancestors, its natural wild ancestors. So that gives light gives rise to this either the simple line number two that intensive means poor wealth fundamentally means poor welfare it's simply wrong if you to look at these two pictures of a, of a of dairy cows in two very different situations you fundamentally say of course in a field grazing more natural must provide better welfare whereas the animal that's in a house system um year round fundamentally can't enjoy the same quality of life but that's not necessarily true when you look at what does the life look like, look like for that animal? It's, what are its needs being met? What does it have to do? What, are, what stresses is, is it exposed to on a daily basis? And if you look at what really matters to a cow, the questions that we should be asking are these rather than whether or not it's outside. And certainly behavioral studies of cattle have shown that they have no preference for grazing. They have no particular preference for being outdoors other than for potentially thermoregulation at night. Whereas in modern intensive systems, look at the needs of the animal, look at the, the, what the animals respond to and supply those on a daily basis, 24 seven, 365 days of the year. And alongside that, the concept that scale, which is often sort of uh, almost um, uh, indistinguishable from, from intensive in, in livestock systems, scale also contributes to poor welfare. And again, that's not true. If we look at an example in the UK dairy, uh, for dairy herds, the UK average herd size is about 200 cows, average yields about 27 litres a day. The figures we've got here from uh, come from AHDB um, for, for welfare and health indicators for mobility. Alarmingly, only 72% of the UK dairy herd is, is, is considered to be fully mobile, so 28% lame at any one time. Mastitis incidents, 32 cases per 100 cows per year, and about 6% of the UK herd is culled in the first 100 days in milk, which is effectively an indicator of involuntary culling. Culling is a consequence of management failure. But if we were to look at four examples of herds that would intuitively constitute high risk, these are large herds, seven to 10 times as large as the UK average, yielding 50% more milk per day per cow and house 365 days of the year. But their welfare metrics, their health metrics are considerably better. 96, 95% mobility, single digit figures in many cases of mastitis and much, much lower levels of involuntary culling. And why is that? It's because of management. Management is the single biggest determinant of welfare provision, not system. We need to make sure we do not confuse aesthetics with welfare or sustainability. All production systems can provide excellent health and welfare, all have innate risks. It's appropriate management rather than scale or system that mitigates those risks and determines welfare outcomes. But the other question is, which one does it for the lowest resource use or environmental impact per unit of output? Which brings me on to line number four, that intensive is necessarily bad for the environment. And this is certainly not the case, or certainly not when you look at it at, 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 a, at an industry scale and supplying the, the, the needs of the, the food needs of the market. And, and increasingly, scientific opinion is backing this up, that intensive farming is potentially the least bad, as it's put by the BBC, um, option for food and the environment. In, in response to it, and this was in response to a study done in 2018 by the University of Cambridge, published in Nature, that said that despite the perception that eco-friendly agriculture um, uh, is intuitively better for the environment, the reality is that high yield farming uses less land. And despite per acre it might generate or potentially generate higher levels of externalities, those underestimate the impacts of lower yield systems. And when it looked at dairying, again, as an example, organic farming took up twice as much land and caused at least one third more loss of soil, for example, than conventional dairying to produce the same amount of milk. And this was borne out in a much more quantitative study done in the States approximately 10 years ago that looked at the comparison for total resource use and environmental impact of producing a billion litres of milk. 
um, in, in 2007 under intensive conditions compared to 1940s, which was much more extensive pastoral low input systems. And the, the report concluded that modern dairy practice used considerably lower resources in terms of feed, in terms of land and animals, and had much lower outputs in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and manure and potential pollution. And the overall um, so outcome of that study showed that carbon footprint, which is probably the best proxy for resource efficiency, was a third today compared to what it was 70 years ago. And this has been borne out in other studies in other sectors across livestock agriculture that, that for a given proportion uh, quantity of food, the environmental impact of high uh, intensive high yield farming is lower than the alternatives. And this, if we go back to our four herds in the UK, we look at UK average for carbon footprint for milk is about 1200 grams of carbon per litre. That's two thirds of the world average. The UK is already doing well, but if we look at our large intensive high yielding herds, they're significantly lower again. Which basically means, to, to quote Andrew Bumford, that we, if, if we're serious about sustainability, we need to get smart about high yield agriculture. And we're in the middle of a technological revolution. And I would argue that should we even be calling it intensive farming, the technology there that, that exists today that allows us to monitor herds, monitor groups, monitor individual animals and, and manage animals individually within large herds on a 24 seven basis. It's smart farming. It provides better productivity and better welfare. And then behind that also, possibly the single largest impact in recent years on, on welfare and productivity has been genomics. The ability to decode DNA and to make better informed breeding decisions across a whole range of traits, not just productivity, but also health and welfare. And finally, perhaps my most contentious issue is, is the idea that consumers demand welfare leadership. Now, this one is something that that, that will, will possibly inflame a lot, of, uh, a lot of opinions. But in reality, what people aspire to and what people will actually pay for are quite different things. And I will use, uh, I will I'll move away from cattle now to look at pigs as, as an example of this. In, 90, in the mid-1990s, the EU passed a, a ruling that gestation crates, dry sow stalls for pigs, was going to be outlawed in 2013, which I think most people across the industry and, and the welfare uh, lobby would welcome. But the UK, in response to welfare lobbying, decided that UK consumers wouldn't accept um, uh, 2013. That was too far in the future. They wanted it done sooner. So the UK banned the use of dry sow stalls in 1999, uh, 12, 13 years before the rest of Europe. And what happened as a result of that was that rather than UK consumers switching over to uh, supposedly higher welfare pork, we saw what we did see in, in reality was a 40% drop between 98 and 2005 in the numbers of sows in the UK as, as UK pig producers just simply couldn't compete with pig meat coming in from the continent produced to standards that, that UK consumers supposedly deemed unacceptable. And that decline didn't level out until finally the EU sow stall ban was introduced in 2013. So the reality was whilst many people aspired to this higher welfare pork, very few were prepared to pay for it. So this isn't a matter of, of whether or not we should do something, but it's about timing determines the difference between real welfare leadership and merely virtue signaling. And to sum up the, the output of that, all we ended up doing by banning sow stalls earlier, by making that supposedly leadership move earlier, was to give more money to European producers to reinvest in systems that were deemed unacceptable. So we need to be very, very careful about not only what we do, but how and when we do it. So when you take all those things into consideration, if key objective welfare standards can be sustainably met by intensive systems, then surely it's the market, not the most equitable way to determine more subjective, higher voluntary standards. Thank you very much. Thanks, David, for your presentation. And I would like to start this debate by offering my views regarding the definition of intensive farming. And then I will discuss agriculture intensification, animal welfare, and anthropomorphism. And finally, I will, dis I will debate the relationship between intensive livestock farming and environment and sustainable intensification. 
Um, as an economist, I agree with the definition of intensive farming as high levels of input and output per unit of agriculture land. However, I will argue uh, when it comes to systems of animal production, there is no clear definition of intensive, which leads to confusion amongst academics and the wider public. And I base my argument on some work I have done recently, a systematic review which I conducted on the societal um, understanding of pig production systems. Although all the selecti selected articles included references to animal uh, production or husbandry systems, none provided a clear definition of what an intensive production systems, system actually, actually means. Uh, instead, definition or instead words such as commercial, conventional, modern, contemporary, industrialized, um, indoor, as opposed to organic, outdoor, extensive, and low input farming were used to describe pig production systems. But some will ask, is it important to have a clear definition to describe a production system? I will argue that it is, and my argument relates mainly to the negative image that the general public has, re has uh, regarding current, current agricultural practices. The public associates uh, modern pig, uh, pig farming with agrarian factors being industrialized and intensive livestock farming, and they usually use words such as large and crowded farms to describe it. So farm size, or more precisely, the number of animals matters significantly, significantly when evaluating pig production systems. And large scale uh, is regarded as bad, whereas small scale is good. So anybody who is looking at uh, this slide and the photos on my slide, which shows the, all the, the world's biggest multi-story not car park, uh, but farm in Henan province in China, and the largest single built hatchery in the UK will think of them as farm, as farm factories. So my first argument is that without a clear definition of an intensive production system, it is difficult to assess with accuracy impacts on both animal welfare and sustainability. And this is particularly important from the, pub, from the public's point of view, who perceives large scale farms as bad and small scale as good. And this will bring me to the next point of debate, which you pointed out on your presentation. And this is about agricultural intensification and anthropomorphism. Most studies acknowledge the level of uh, livestock intensif intensification that has taken place since the end of the Second World War in Western agriculture production system, and more recently in other countries such as China, uh, Brazil, and, and India. But I will argue that is, it is not intensification per se, which sits at the foundation of human civilization, but the economic concept of efficiency, which can be defined broadly as output divided by input or the output input ratio. It is true that in economic terms, uh, animals are nothing but a resource employed in food production. So their use value and importance are linked to what they contribute to economic output. The possibility of increasing animal productivity and the welfare of the animals involved can be defined conceptually as a production or a supply possibility frontier as defined by Mack and Ernie in 1991. And if you look at this curve, we can see that the curve illustrates that domestication and subsequent cultivation of wild animals has resulted in, in improvement in both animal productivity and uh, animal welfare. And you could see that on the top left-hand segment of the frontier. Similarly, as often illustrated, over-intensification can result in reductions in both productivity and welfare. And this is uh, clearly uh, emphasized on the bottom right-hand segment of the frontier. 
Some of you will say, okay, this is just a simple diagram, which cannot necessarily portray the, the complexity of farming or the marketing chain reality. But this is an economic framework, which is log logical, it's robust and well accepted, or at least um, you know, amongst economists. But economics is just one aspect. And society with social, with its social uh, norms, moral responsibilities, and individual preferences adds additional value to animal. And this is uh, labeled uh, as the non-use or the ethical value of animals, which cannot be ignored. And this was again uh, labeled by McInerney. Uh, although it is argued that value is a human construct or a reflection of perception, and again in machinery words, and I'm citing, animal welfare is a subset of human welfare, so the animal's preferences and well-being having a relevance only to the extent that are important to us, I will argue that is the non-use value that influences our perception of what good animal welfare means. But it is hard to deny that animals feel pain, they enjoy eating, they, they have their own experience, they experience fear and they experience uh, happiness and they have emotion. And I just want to provide some examples. For example, a cows produce 10% less milk, when a person who frightens them is present, uh, but they are less fearful and more approachable when treated with care. Calves separated from mums get frustrated and animals who are castrated show a uh, sign of experience pain. And I would also like to point an example from our research at Newcastle University when some years ago, uh, our researchers showed that cows with name, uh, names produce more milk than those which remained unnamed. And for this, they got the 2009 Ig Nobel Prize. Uh, but uh, how feasible is to give names to thousands of chickens and pigs, which we know that due to their short uh, reproduction cycles, high feed conversion, efficiency, and grain-based diets are easier to rear in confined, more intensive production. Um, production system. Uh, so our perception differs also across species with some animals more equal than the others, although not necessarily Orwellian pigs. Although as a scientist, I agree that intensive and big does not necessarily mean for animal welfare as you presented, there are plenty of studies which support this point. This point. The societal perception is that the larger the farm, the weaker the interaction between the farmer and the animal, as farmers have less time to dedicate to individual animals. There is also the perception that in large scale farms, animals are more prone to disease, hence the need to use antibiotics more often, which, is in, which in turn is perceived as being bad for human health. In contrast, the perception is that traditional small-scale farms are regarded positively. So my second argument is that economic efficiency of production systems is paramount and good animal husbandry is crucial to achieve it. Intensity of production is of secondary importance. However, when it comes to animal welfare, we, can talk, we cannot ignore the non-use value of animals. And one may argue that societal negative perception may be the result of conflicting attitudes, but I will argue that if the farming industry does not demonstrate otherwise, intensive livestock farming will remain the purveyor of farm animal, of poor animal welfare. So this brings me to the last point of the debate, and this is the relationship between intensive livestock farming and the environment and sustainable intensification. As with the other definition, sustainability, it's a very complex and multidimensional concept, which incorporates three pillars, 
people, profit, and planet. But I will argue that animal welfare should be included as a pillar on its own. We all know that to achieve sustainability, whatever that means, is difficult. And that is because it requires an integrated approach and the consideration of the potential trade offs between um, components. And we also know this is particularly challenging for livestock production, which possesses several challenges in relation to sustainability of food, of food production, including its disproportionate contribution to the environmental cost of agriculture through resource use, including water, soil, air, and biodiversity. The environmental impact of its waste and the increasing amount of uh, crops used as feed for animals. And again, I do not disagree with, you, with, the, with your argument regarding the least bad impacts of intensive farming on environment. And one should be cautious when aff affirming that intensive livestock farming is the main culprit as opposed to extensive farming. But two wrongs don't make a right. And we know that there are concerns that large scale farms are affecting water courses following an increase in animal waste, pollute the air, and this is particularly uh, the case for pig and poultry, uh, exacerbate the green, the greenhouse uh, gas emission, and that there is a higher risk of disease among large flocks of herds. And we also know that there are concerns regarding the impact of sustainable intensification of, of animal welfare. And in this slide, I would just would like to quote the uh, um, um, to, to quote the concern expressed by the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeon, uh, Surgeons and the British Veterinary Association. And in, it's clear that if you, uh, I'm not going to to read the, to cite the, the entire paragraph, but I just want to point out that there was that feeling that changes in animal production and in farming practices in order to provide affordable food, it, it, it will be likely to exacerbate tension in terms of maintaining the highest standards of welfare for production animals. So my last argument will be that to be considered a genuinely uh, sustainable strategy, farmers should be able to produce in a resource efficient, animal welfare friendly, environmental sound and competitive way. However, and I'm quoting Groom, no system of procedure is sustainable if a substantial proportion of people find aspects of it, of it now, or of its consequences in the future, morally unacceptable. And instead of conclusion, I would just like to uh, leave you all the audience to read the, uh, the code, a quote from Jerry B Bent, uh, Jeremy Bentham uh, from its introduction to the principles of morals and legislation. Uh, thank you for your attention. And thank you so much, David and Carmen. There was a lot to, um, to take in there, um, lots of interesting questions and thoughts put forward. You both set out your definitions of intensive farming, sustainability and welfare. And it would be really interesting to know if the audience agrees with your definitions, because some of these are open to interpretation. And I can see some of the comments already coming in talking about, well, it depends what data you use and things like that. So. Audience, I would really encourage you to get involved. So if you head over to the Slido tab, you will have the opportunity to ask some questions there. If you see any questions that you are really keen on, that you like the look of them, please upvote them because I will be picking out the popular ones later when we start our panel discussion as well. So next up, um, we have Professor Jimmy Turnbull, who, like David, is proposing the motion that intensive farming is good for, for farm welfare and sustainability. Professor Cathy Dwyer will follow and oppose the motion. Jimmy, a vet by trade, is a professor at the University of Stirling's Institute of Aquaculture and has completed extensive research in the health and welfare of farmed aquatic populations. 
Cathy, who you may recall, presented at the 2019 forum, is director of the Gene Marching International Centre for Animal Welfare, Education, and head of the Animal Behaviour and Welfare Research Team at the SRUC. So here you are, both their presentations. Hello, my name is Jimmy Turnbull. I'm a vet and a professor at the Institute of Aquaculture in the University of Stirling in central Scotland. Uh, my presentation in support of the motion today, intensification can be good for sustainability and welfare, is going to use aquaculture as a case study. So what is aquaculture? Well, aquaculture is any form of farming in water. It can be anything from plants to mollusks to crustaceans to fin fish, which is what we usually think about, but also amphibians and, and reptiles. So is aquaculture important? Well, most people agree it is. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations uh, have said that increased fish consumption can address many of the most widespread and severe nutritional deficiencies, especially in the developing world. And it's been estimated that fish is the primary source of protein for over a billion mostly poor people. It is and has been the fastest growing food production sector for nearly 50 years, and it's the only one that's grown faster than human population. So it's up by 527% since 1970. And if we compare that with wild fisheries or wild fish, the sustainable fish stocks are down by 25% and only 90% are now overfished or fished to capacity. So there's very little scope for any uh, expansion in production from that area. So is intensive aquaculture sustainable? And as David said earlier, Sustainability has several aspects to it, not just environmental, but also social, economic, and ethical. I'm gonna make two main arguments here. One is that criticisms of intensive aquaculture are often outdated and misleading, if not blatantly disingenuous, and also that aquaculture is a good use of resources. Everybody's bound to have heard the story that the intensive shrimp farming destroys mangroves. That's just wrong. Traditional extensive systems sometimes do damage mangroves and in fact sometimes they're almost a form of slash and burn agriculture within the mangrove forests. Intensive shrimp farming does not use mangrove areas and there's a very good reason for this. The soil in mangroves is usually potentially acid sulfate which means if you dig a pond and fill it with water it turns into dilute sulfuric acid which kills the shrimp. So it just doesn't happen and it hasn't happened for decades and decades. Another thing that you'll hear is a lot of captured fisheries goes to feed farmed fish. Again, this is wrong. I read something just the other day from somebody who should have known better saying it takes two kilograms of wild fish to grow every kilogram of farmed salmon, which is just nonsense. Only a small proportion of fisheries goes to feed farmed fish. Oh. Of all the capture fisheries in the world, 88% of it goes for human consumption. The 12% goes for everything else. This includes animal feeds, but also things like fertilizer. And of all the animal feeds or ag agricultural feeds, only 4% goes for fish. So it's a very small proportion of the total capture fisheries that ends up in aquaculture. And as aquaculture is intensified, it's led to better use of resources. So back in 1990, the average farmed salmon was fed a diet of about 75% fish meal and oil and had a food conversion ratio of 1 to 2 or 1 to 2.5. So that's improved now up to uh, a diet which generally contains 25% fish meal and oil or less and an amazing food conversion ratio of 1 to 1.2. Now, they can only achieve that sort of food conversion ratio because they're cold-blooded animals which live in water, and so their weight is supported. And so they have a very, very low resting metabolic rate. So at the moment, it takes about 300 kilograms of fish to produce one tonne of farm salmon. And overall, in aquaculture, it takes about 500 kilograms of uh, wild fish to produce one tonne farmed fish. So this is actually compares well with wild fisheries. It actually takes less wild fish to grow a farmed salmon than it does to grow a wild salmon. 
Also, if you look at carbon footprint or greenhouse gas emissions, and with all these estimates, there's a massive amount of uncertainty. So the exact figures are probably not that reliable. But if we look from the top here, it's one, two, three, four, five down, you'll see farmed fish. And it, what this graph tells us is that farmed fish compares favorably with any other form of meat production. So what about welfare? Well, should we even care about the welfare of fish? I would argue we should. There are a huge number of animals involved. Estimates go from 40 to 120 billion fish killed each year for human consumption. That does include wild capture fisheries as well as aquaculture. Also farmed fish are relatively long lived. A farmed salmon can be up to 28 months old by the time it's harvested, whereas a chicken's roughly about 1.5 months. There's also a lot of evidence of complex mental processes learning by observation, tool use, good memory, et cetera, et cetera. It would take hours to just discuss this area, but there's a lot of evidence for complex mental processes. So how about pain, consciousness, and suffering in fish? Well, this is an area that's still debated, but the law says they can suffer pain. And so to some extent, the, the debate is a bit moot. One question that's often asked is, can intensively reared fish have a good life? And that raises the question, what is a good life or a life worth living for a fish? Well, the positive animal uh, welfare literature would say there's four components uh, to positive welfare in animals. And in fish, translating that into something kind of practical and realistic, that probably looks like choice of temperature, depth, light, uh, social interaction, the ability to join in the shoal, the ability to exercise and the ability to rest, stimulation and enrichment, and food that not only um, fulfills the nutritional requirements, but also fulfills the behavioral requirements. And there are more resources to provide all of these things in intensive systems. And there's also market pressure is a powerful incentive to demonstrate good welfare. So it's not just a matter of the resources are there, they're actually used to improve welfare. So intensive aquaculture, more resources to avoid poor welfare, and more resources to provide positive welfare. So what I'm going to do now is look at a few examples from extensive and intensive aquaculture and uh, just compare the two. So when we look at disease control in extensive aquaculture, there's a lack of biosecurity, prevention, diagnosis and treatment, resulting in very high levels of disease and suffering. This means that in extensive systems, sometimes the, the mortality rate is nearly as high as it is in the wild, which is very large if you know anything about natural ecosystems. Harvest is just making the best of a bad job with the resources you have available um, and can be a very unpleasant experience for the fish and for the people involved. When we think about slaughter, it's often death by asphyxiation or worse. And this is often due to a lack of education and training. This guy here is processing this poor fish alive. And I'm sure he's not a bad guy. He just doesn't know any better. He hasn't been told or trained to kill the fish first. And I'm going to stop it there because it gets a bit gruesome. If we compare that with uh, more intensive systems, there are more effective disease control methods, and we can demonstrate this because survival has improved over the years. There's more effective biosecurity, environmental control, diagnosis, more effective vaccines, and this has all resulted in a low incidence of treatment. And if there's evidence for this as well, the, the Scottish salmon industry uses less antibiotics than any other meat production system in the UK. At harvest, because there's more resources, it's possible to uh, be careful how you handle the animals, handle them slowly and gently so that they're not stressed. This not only improves the welfare of the fish, but it also improves the, uh, the quality of the product which results from the fish in the end. Intensive farming systems also have the resources to buy expensive bits of equipment like uh, in-water electrical stunners, like this piece of equipment here. 
that this ensures that the fish are insensible before they're slaughtered and greatly uh, reduces the risk of poor welfare at slaughter. But the equipment and its maintenance is not cheap. And I want to finish just by talking about investing in welfare through education and training. Um, this is a promotional video for something called Aquacare 365. I'm going to run it in the background and I'm going to apologise to Jennifer for talking over the top of her. So this programme was developed by Merck Animal Health in conjunction with several aquaculture companies and has already been rolled out um, in, in both in North America but also in other parts of the world. And it's uh, had a demonstrable effect. Um, not only has there been an improvement in fish welfare, but there's also been an improvement in job satisfaction and also employee retainment. So the, the aquaculture companies think this has really been a worthwhile investment. And so with that, I will end and I'll thank you for listening to this presentation and I look forward to the debate. Thank you. Hi, everybody. In this final presentation in the debate, what I'd like to do is really put some evidence behind some of the relationships between farming, sustainability and animal welfare. So I think we probably all agree, actually, on David's definition of what intensive farming is, that's higher levels of input and output per unit of land. But as Carmen has already told us, sometimes that's quite difficult because there's no one definition of where something becomes intensive. Now, but I think we, we probably all really know where we are in terms of talking about this. And we're not really talking about these sorts of systems in India, where perhaps if we take this, this cow that's out foraging, uh, living on plastic bags and rubbish, and we move them into a system where we provide them with some fresh food and healthcare, clearly productivity for that animal will increase, and so will its welfare. But this isn't really the system that we're thinking about when we talk about intensive farming. In fact, this is much more where most of the pigs, poultry, and increasingly dairy cows live in production systems across the globe. So they still have higher levels of input and output. Um, but this intensification really comes by animals being kept at higher and higher stocking density. So we see animals indoors, behind bars, often in large groups, with very little space to move around or they're kept in environments that uh, perhaps were suitable once, but now the animals have grown through genetic selection. They are producing more and more, and these systems don't meet their needs. So David has also told us that uh, we should guard against anthropomorphism when we think about animal welfare. So what I'm gonna talk about is the science of animal welfare. So this isn't my opinion, this is the data and the evidence that we collect when we want to understand how well an animal is coping or how well it's adapted to the environment in which we've put it in. And these are the sorts of tools that I would use every day in thinking about the quality of life for an animal. So what, how well is the animal able to cope? And we know that when animals are unable to cope or when they are struggling to adapt to the environment, that they're under stress. And this brings about changes in behavior and it brings us about changes in particular axes, particularly the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and the production of glucocorticoids. And these are both things that we can measure and then we can use that to understand how well the animal is coping. And the increase in glucocorticoids affects the metabolism of the animal and it affects their immune function. And I'm just in the time I've got very quickly gonna show you a few examples of how we know by making these sorts of measures that the animals are not able to cope with some of these environments. So the first example I'm gonna give you is some work done in my group, looking at the behavior and the, um, the coping ability of farrowing sows. So sows, just before they're about to give birth, will build a nest. And you can see that in the bottom picture, when the animal has enough space, it's a more extensive environment where the animal has space and resources, and they can build this nest um, just before they give birth. The animal in the top panel is in a farrowing crate. She doesn't have bedding. And she can see in this graph that she has higher amounts of cortisol in that period when she wants to nest build, which we would consider to be behavioral frustration. This is her inability to adapt to the intensive environment, and we can measure that. In this example, again, this is work coming from our group, looking at how we manage young, growing, and finishing pigs. 
And at the top picture, you can see pigs on slats, pigs in an intensive environment. And what happens here is we see an increase in tail biting. So you can see that in the picture of the tail. And a paper, recent paper from our group looked at different sorts of pig housing and management scenarios and whether the, the pigs showed tail biting or not. And this leads us then to another manipulation. So rather than changing the environment and making it less intensive, what we do is often is dock or cut off the tails of these pigs to try and reduce the incidence of tail biting. And we can see that in the, the, uh, the quote in the yellow box that tail docking is really something that's occurring at 80% or greater in the countries in Europe. So even though in these countries we're supposed to consider whether it's necessary or not, it is considered by more than 80% of pig producers that this is necessary to prevent this tail biting, which comes about because the animals in this impoverished environment. A third example I'm going to show you is of broiler chickens. So these are meat chickens and they've been heavily selected to grow fast and they're kept in at very high stocking density, often at low light intensities. So a study in 2008 demonstrated that about three and a half percent of all broiler chickens on farms in the UK were unable to walk. So it may not sound like a huge part of the population, but this is 32 million birds in these situations. Again, a recent paper that came out last year showed that we can improve the welfare of these birds by using slower growing breeds. So birds that are less intensively managed, less intensively husbanded, less, less intensively selected. And the faster growing breeds had the poorest health in terms of mortality, rejection of carcasses, inability to walk. They had the most hock burn and the most pododermatitis. So on really objective indicators of poor welfare, those intensively managed birds had the poorer welfare compared to slower growing breeds. I could show you many, many other examples, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to the other part of this, which is really about sustainability. So I think the science of animal welfare has conclusively demonstrated that intensification has led to poorer welfare in those animals that are kept in those systems. But what about sustainability? So if again, if we go back to the science of animal welfare, we know that when animals are stressed, the glucocorticoids cause an increase in their metabolic rate and reduces their immune function, particularly when these animals are chronically stressed and these conditions continue for a long period of time, as we see in intensive farming, where the animals live in conditions that are unable to meet their needs. So those animals have a reduced growth rate, reduced fertility, reduced maternal behavior, that higher rate of piglet savaging that we see in crated sows, reductions in milk intake that we see, milk production that we see in dairy cows that are lame, and increased disease susceptibility. And all this leads to reduced productivity. So the way that we sustain these intensive systems is through interventions, antibiotics, medicines, genetic selection for animals that are less reactive to the environment in which we keep them. And really we can ask, are this really a sustainable approach to increase our inputs, to try and overcome the fact that the welfare of these animals in these systems are poor and this is affecting productivity. So just to give you some examples again from the science base that tells us how well or not animals can cope with these environments. So this is a study in pigs comparing pigs kept in a more barren intensive environment or so conventional housing versus pigs given more space, given bedding, given things to interact with so a less intensive environment. And when animals were given a disease, in this case, it was the PERS virus, they showed that those pigs that were kept in the enriched environment, so the less intensive environment, coped better with the viral infection. They had a faster clearance of RNA in the serum and they had nearly three times fewer lung lesions compared to the pigs kept in the more barren environment. So by keeping animals in these intensive environments, we're increasing their, their, um, their disease pathologies and increasing the amount of medicines that we need to give them, which is hardly a very sustainable system. 
This is another example that's come from my colleague Baz Roddenberg in, in Bargainingen. And he showed us recently that by transitioning from fast growing broiler chickens, which take 39 days to reach finishing, to a, even just an intermediate growing bird, so 10 days slower to grow, but also kept at lower stocking density, so a less intensive system. And by making that transition between 2009 and 2017, they had a 63% reduction in the total sales of veterinary antibiotics. So they were able to reduce the use of antimicrobials through de-intensifying these systems. And I think one of the, the traps that we fall into when we think about intensification and its efficiency and how we need to keep this sort of increased productivity and efficiency to meet consumer demands for food, we fall into what's considered to be the Jeevan's paradox. So this is where we increase efficiency and that reduces the price of a commodity. And then that increases the demand and then increases consumption for that commodity. So we can't really point at the sort of graph that we have here on the right and say, well, we couldn't possibly have fed everybody without needing many thousands more dairy cows, because that completely ignores the externality that by reducing the price of that commodity, we created that demand in the first place. So we end up with these increasing efficiency, which doesn't actually lead to improved sustainability. It just increases the demand for the product. And I'd really like to just sort of finish with a view on um, how sustainable our food production systems are. That if we really need to have these higher and higher levels of intensification to feed ourselves, then why do we waste so much food? So the FAO, for example, has suggested that about a third of all food produced for human consumption is wasted globally. A very recent paper that came out this year shows that 10% of all meat and fish uh, bought for human consumption is wasted in the UK. And so because these prices are cheap, we have this system where we have overconsumption of products and then we have high levels of waste. And we could do a lot more to improve sustainability by dealing with this rather than pushing animals harder and harder in our systems. So I think what the data tells us really is this actual inconvenient truth, which is the intensification that pushes animals beyond their capacity to adapt to the environment leads to poor animal welfare. Poor animal welfare really leads to poor productivity and then to poor sustainability by the actions we have to take to try and bolster productivity. And I'd like to finish just with a quote uh, from the great David Attenborough, who sums this up very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy and Kathy. Now, there is a lot to take in there. Um, and I'd now like to welcome all the speakers back onto stage to have our panel session and discussion session where I will be posing your questions to our panelists so that we can have a good debate. Now, we have opened up the chat function as well. So please do he head over there if you want to have just a discussion amongst yourselves about what you're hearing. Just please remember to keep your comments respectful and on topic but do also head over to the Slido tab where you can ask questions that you'd like me to post to the panelists and also upvote your favorite ones so that we can make sure that they get asked. So welcome everybody. And once again, thank you um, everyone for your amazing presentations. So um, David, I'm gonna head to you first. So one of the most popular questions that has come through and this comes from James. As a farm vet, I believe you set out the definition of health and not welfare. Being monitored 24 seven health helps health, but can it give a life worth living on its own? I think I'll go back to, to the point I made is that uh, a life worth living is a highly subjective um, concept. And the, the, I, I did post the, uh, or put the, the, the points there that what matters to a cow, what matters to a pig, what matters to a chicken. And I, I'm of, of the view, I understand fully that, 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 that there is this, and this is why I raised the point about anthropomorphism. Um, if you look at it in terms of a hierarchy of needs, then I think intensive systems that are well managed and well configured, there is no tension between productivity um, and, and welfare and health outcomes. And therefore, we can provide the vast majority 
of the um, of, of the the needs of an animal or the or the wants of an animal. It's that grey area at the end that, that what and until you can clearly define what a life worth living actually means, it's a very difficult question to answer. I hope I'm not avoiding the question there, but I, I think it's very very difficult one to to to, to give a uh, to to satisfy everybody in terms of what is a a life worth living. Kathy, um, I'd like I'd like to bring you in here if that's okay. What what do you think of the comment? I think I'm sorry, David, if I haven't quoted you quite um, correctly. There's no t tension between productivity, health, and welfare. What are your thoughts on that? And I really wanted to come back to the idea that um, that we don't know what an animal needs for a good life, and almost I'm, I may be paraphrasing you here, David, but it almost seems like well because we can't do that, well, we should just forget about it and we'll just focus on the bits that we can manage it, which I think is uh, is you know one of these sort of fallacies, and also I think it really does avoid the question. Sorry, you did say did I avoid it? I think you did. Um, there's actually quite a lot of data out there that tells us what an animal needs in an environment. So these are behavioural needs for the animal, something that, you know, we, we've, we've had 50 or 60 years worth of thinking about these things. So it's not just meeting the health needs of an animal, not just giving it food, not just giving it a bed and thinking our job is done. There's a lot of work that has looked at the more complex things that an animal needs in an environment that accepts that these animals are sentient animals, that they have... Um, particular requirements that matter to them. They don't necessarily matter to us and we don't necessarily recognize them as things that we would want, but we know that the animal needs them. So the, uh, the pig farrowing example, um, and these aren't behaviors that have disappeared because these animals have been domesticated. We know that these behavioral needs are still present in the animal. And often in these intensive environments, we don't consider those to be very important because we don't understand them. And then we don't give the animal those resources. So I think that is the missing bit when we think about the relationship between a production system, its health and its productivity, because we don't always consider what are the important behavioral needs of an animal. And these aren't anthropomorphic. They're not um, subjective things. They are things that we can measure. And there's lots of experiments out there that have measured these things. If I may just come back on that, you made the very valid point that that um, stress in any environment um, manifests itself ultimately in, in a, in a um, reduced uh, reduced health outcomes, re observable outcomes. Yet, if I you go back to my example of the, the dairy herd, the large dairy herds that I use, the ver the most product, some of the most productive, some of the highest output herds in the UK have the very best health outcomes and have correspondingly much lower use of antibiotics and if you look at antibiotic usage across the piece in the UK particularly we've seen a huge reduction in antibiotic usage whilst at the same time productivity is, is continues to rise and that is because best practice is continuous continually evolving so if we see if we can see that that a reduction in antibiotic usage a reduction in in, in these health and and um, and stress related outcomes and a corresponding rise in productivity um, then surely we are a lot further down that route of delivering what that animal needs and what that animal wants um, than think, maybe you maybe you've suggested. No, I think I think we can do exactly that. But I think often one of the problems with these these systems are that so for example some work again from our group looking at um, production efficiency and lameness in dairy cows and we know that there's this tension between lame animals produce less milk, but the way that we might want to reduce lameness is often giving the animals more space, giving the animals bedding, perhaps giving them more freedom to go outside and lie down. So I know they don't always choose to go outside, but they do go outside when they're given that opportunity. Um, and they often, and we see reductions in lameness when the animals have more space and out, outdoor access. And that increases productivity of milk. And actually that data showed that by, by de-intensifying those systems, we did see improved productivity. So there is you know, there is, it's not it's not an anti productivity argument, but it's about it's thinking about how we manage those animals in the system. And I think um, there's a lot that we could be doing to improve any of the systems. And you're absolutely right that the management of the system is really crucial. But there are some systems and I would point to the pig and poultry systems in particular, where I don't think management alone can improve the welfare of those animals. The, the system itself needs to change as well. If I may, I'd just like to bring Carmen in here. Carmen? No, just a few points from me, and uh, thank you very much for David and uh, and Kathy. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I know I'm on Kathy's uh, Kathy team, 
Um, I do think there is a tension between health and welfare and productivity. And I just show you going back, probably, you know, the economists uh, just come back to the same thing over and over again, showing you the, 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 the uh, production frontier. So um, we do know that over-intensification does have um, a, a negative impact on both productivity and welfare. For me also, I think, uh, I don't like to make that definition between uh, animal health and animal welfare. For me, health is part of animal welfare. So if the animal is not well, clearly, clearly that's part, you know, he is, he's not well be, he's not very well. Uh, but also I think, uh, and just to bring something on David's side, um, some years ago, I used, I, I've done research uh, regarding farmer understanding of animal welfare and also the relationship between, uh, how, uh, between the animals and, and the farmer. And it was very clear that if the animal uh, is not well, the farmer used to say they will not try. So it is about, you know, if the animal is happy, and whatever we define happiness in animals, I know we can go and discuss this. Uh, if, it, if the animal is not well, clearly it will not thrive. So it is, there is, there is a link between, between the two. And this will be my point. And, but I also agree with David when it comes regarding uh, management and good husbandry. And I think this is extremely important when it comes to, to animal welfare, whatever the system, the system, uh, the system. Are. Am I still allowed to say something? Yes. Now? Because yeah, I wanted yeah. to point out something um, regarding intensification. And I know Kathy brought this story about efficiency. Uh, probably I'm bringing it to efficient because this is what I know. You know, I'm an economist. I talk about, you know, uh, choices or uh, uh, opportunity cost and uh, scarce resources, how we allocate them. Uh, to me, intensification is not the same as efficiency. And I just want to think to give you an example. Think about the the the, the Australian beef production. So when it comes to to to, to their production, uh, which is very efficient, in terms of land, the land use, we cannot describe is actually be, being uh, intensive. So we can argue that a low input, low output. Uh, can also be uh, efficient. Of course, the aim is not that, uh, my, my point is not, okay, let's, uh, let's move towards low input, low output. That's far from me. And as economists, I absolutely agree with you now how the market works and the market, the importance of the market. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, in any system of, any system of production can become efficient depending on the, the available circumstances depending on the resources, but also about the aim. People talk all the time, you know, profit maximization. That's not really the case. Not, not all businesses are looking, you know, to max, maximize their profit. Of course, you need to make profit, but there are other objectives which firms are looking, including farms. And one will be, you know, the well-being of the farm. And I will stop. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Um, Jimmy, I, I'd quite like to pull you in here, if that's okay. Um, in your presentation, I think you... You said something along the lines of intensif intensification has led to more resources for care. So it'd be great to, to get your take on the conversation we're having here around health and welfare and so on. Thanks, Danielle, and thanks to the other speakers as well. And I, th I think the motion was intensification can be good for sustainability and welfare. It's pretty easy to pull up examples of bad intensive systems and also bad extensive systems so that but it's important that we don't generalize to all extensive or all intensive systems so i feel what we need to do there's no doubt we need to be more productive and and cutting down waste is part of that but we also need to be more productive in terms of use of resources more sustainable and i think what we need to be looking for is systems that are not only good systems but productive systems and, you know, Cathy, sorry, Cathy, if I, if I criticise some of your comments, but you were very much making the point that it was evidence-based. Well, in some intensive systems, such as salmon farming, there's a great deal of evidence that intensification has led to less disease, less use of medicine, less mortality, and more productivity. Exactly the opposite of some of these 
some of the poor intensive systems that we see in pigs and, and chickens. And I think both David and I have some issues with those intensive systems. So it's not a case of all intensive or all extensive. What we're looking at here, the, the sort of heart of the motion is intensification can be good for welfare. I think you're asking can to do a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence, to be honest. I mean, yes, of course, you know, we can think of a system that might be able to achieve all these things. But I think, you know, to go back to Carmen's graph, unfortunately, as human beings, we always seem to just push things a little bit further. So we can have, we do have systems where we intensify and that improves welfare. And of course, it does depend on what your comparator is. And I was struck by, you know, you showed us a picture of someone filleting a live fish. Now that's poor practice. That's nothing to do with what sort of system it is. That's poor practice. And that's something that has an impact on welfare. So I think we're both maybe a little bit, you know, and we had very short amounts of time. So maybe we would cherry pick the bits that displayed <laughs> our, our points best. And, I, you know, I'll give you that. I think we both do that. But I think there are, you know, to, to, to suggest that all inten intensification is the panacea for food problems, that we can ignore the sentience of the animals in the situations that we have them in. I think is, is probably the biggest concern here that um, if, we, if we drive ourselves down this route that it's production at all costs because we need to feed a planet and um, we're going to do it this way and often there's vested interests in those people who put you know to, to, to increase productivity um, and perhaps in, in places like the UK we don't need to increase productivity to feed our populations that might be true if we were talking about India, China, Vietnam, Southeast Asia but it's not an issue here. And I think, but we often use that argument to justify practices, which uh, I think David made the point that um, if only, you know, if only consumers or citizens knew what went on, they'd be quite happy with agriculture. But there is actually good evidence that that's not true. When people have been taken to sea farms and not just commercial farms, you know, there was, this, there was a study in Canada where they took um, citizens to see their own research farm because they felt that if, if only people knew that the consumers of the products knew how milk was produced in a well-run dairy farm with high welfare on the sort of objective measures we might make then they'll be happy and they, they'll stop complaining and actually it had the opposite effect so people realized that the system was even worse than they thought it was so I think the idea that if we just educate people they'll be happy with these practices is just just not supported by, I'm afraid, by the evidence. People don't like these systems. Okay, so if we, right, so if we go David, then Carmen. I'll just unmute myself. No, I'd agree entirely, and I think that, that there is, and it was one of the points that I made, that um, there is this disconnect between between consumers and, uh, and food producers, and, and I think we need to be cognizant, but both ways. Um, and also the, the, this understanding of, of um, you know, how do we sustainably feed a global population of seven, eight, nine billion people um, is a very different proposition to feeding a global population of one and a half billion people. So what we can't, if we can't talk to the animals, if the animals can't directly speak to us, we have to look, look at other proxy indicators. And I think that there are enough of those to show that if we can create an environment in which the animal's stress levels are minimized, um, the animal's health is uh, health outputs are or outcomes are are optimized, um, then productivity is a is an outcome. It's not a target. It's a consequence of providing an environment for animals that, that allows them to thrive and allows them to express their genetic potential. Um, but we do need to be absolutely cognizant of, of, of consumer concerns, but also I think that there's been huge um, advances made in recent years. That, that we're, we're still in a, in a very dynamic situation that agricultural intensification, particularly livestock intensification has happened over the last 30 or 40 years. We've learned massively from the mistakes of the past. And if you look at the, most of the, the selection criteria now for, for, for all, across all livestock species, the focus is on delivering stress-free, high health, high welfare, more so than, than, than looking for productivity gain. Because the, the productivity comes as a consequence of delivering a better environment and lower stress for those animals. Thank you, David. I think you've, you've touched on a few things that I'll come back to. I think you've touched on indirectly, perhaps, food waste potentially, um, and genetics. So I will come back to that, Carmen. Yeah, Daniela, thank you. It's exactly what I wanted actually to, to say. Uh, <laughs> so 
it is about the, and also probably oh, I'm sorry uh, if, I, I like the last slide you know which Kathy put on and uh, I know Kathy said is that a good slide about economists oh please keep because economists are economists and we do have our way of, of thinking uh, although you know people may disagree with us but I will I also think that uh, uh, you know it does make sense and what I'm what I try to 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 say is that um, um, I'm not really afraid of the, the increasing number of population in the world. I, 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 I'm, I just think sometimes I'm, I'm annoyed with the fact that it is abused. And we know that, you know, Malthus uh, was, was, was proved wrong. And I think, again, I believe that that will be the case in the future because we have a brain and we can come out with things. And we talk about, you know, genomics, technology and so on. And I believe in that, but also for the moment, and I'm just talking at this moment, we can feed the world. We can feed the entire world. There's no need, you know, for in the end or to increase their productivity because it's, it's about the distribution of income and the distribution of resources and brings them back to the food waste. So uh, we can still do that. So I'm actually optimistic. And as an economist, I also think I can bring arguments about that. And I know I'm on Kati's side, but um, although Jim show us that picture, which may have been disturbing to some, some people, okay, but we need to think about also culture. We can't just think about, uh, the, the, uh, we can't impose ev everything on everybody. And we need somehow to, to, to be leaders in, in improving animal welfare, but we need to think about that there are other things uh, which people need to take into consideration. And to me, culture, it is important. So Katia, I don't want to, you know, to, to disagree with you, but I think we need to take a little bit, um, some other things into consideration. It's not really so straight, uh, you know, white and black. So, so if I may, Kathy, if I may, I'm gonna pull in a question because I think it, fits in with this, um, which I think uh, will be slightly controversial, some of the responses I suspect. So Sheila has sent us in uh, a question saying, so if meeting behavioral needs is key, then that would suggest that farmed salmon can never be kept in a good welfare situation as they've removed the ability to migrate. So who would, Jimmy or Kathy, who would like to go for Jimmy, go on then, then we'll come to you, Kathy. Yeah, um, this is an old argument. Um, why do salmon migrate? Is it in fact a behavioural need? There's no evidence for that at all. Um, there is some evidence, although even that's pretty inconclusive, that salmon migrate in order to obtain resources. So if that's the case, then if you provide them resources, there's no need for them to migrate. So I think we need to be careful um, when, when we're looking at, you know, as Cathy said, we, we should use evidence and, and try and be objective about these things as far as possible and, and rational about them. And I think that we, we need to make sure that we're actually looking at evidence rather than just subjective opinion. And, and I, th I think in this particular case, we don't know if migration is a behavioural need of salmon. So how can we possibly say not allowing them to migrate is, is frustrating and it, 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 it's not a sound argument? I was going to make probably actually the same point, really. I mean, the way that we um, the way that we understand what are important. So it's behavioural needs and the sort of naturalness of behaviour is not about giving the animal the opportunity to do everything it would do in the wild. So, you know, predation, I think, as, as David suggested, we're not really wanting our farmed sheep to be chased about by a predator just because that might happen in the wild. And that's, a you know, running away from a predator is not a behavioral need, it's a response. And so what we do in the science and the evidence is ask the animal, and actually we can ask the animal what they want. We, we have a whole raft of behavioral techniques and methods that have been well established over quite a long period of time that can allow us to ask the animal what do you want in your environment? How much do you want it? And do you suffer if it doesn't exist? Now, we haven't done that with fish. So like Jimmy, I don't know the answer to that question because I don't know whether they need it or not, or whether it's, it's a response to the environment that they're in. We do know that some of the bird species that are migratory do show evidence that they want to migrate if we prevent them from migrating when there's changes in, in day length. But the triggers for fish might be different. And I'm not I'm not a fish biologist, so I can't really answer that question. But, but, what, but what we can do using behavioral science is understand what 
aspects of the environment does the animal actually find really important? So things like dust bathing in chickens, perch use, having the opportunity to build a nest are all things. The reason why we, we now um, give those animals those things in, for laying hens is because we know that those are important behavioral needs. And that with that is through, um, not through anthropomorphism, but through research that has shown how important those resources are to the animal. Carmen or David, do you want to add anything at this stage? David? I would yeah, just add to that and going uh, using the, the, the dairy example, and I think I'd agree with, with what Cathy said, and I think I'm, I'm familiar with some of that research, a lot of which was done at the University of British Columbia on dairy cows by Nina von Kieselink, where they, where they looked at, at what, anim, uh, what cows are telling us in, in terms of how hard will they push at a, at a spring-loaded gate to get to either grazing or to get to, to, to a TMR, total mixed ration, or to lie down. Or, or to be with other members, uh, other herd members, and and I think that research proved that, for example, grazing, which is often cited as uh, the denial of the ability to graze, is often cited as a major criticism of intensive dairying. There's absolutely no proof anywhere that a cow will actively choose to go out and graze when it's when it's faced with the opportunity of eating a prepared meal in front of it. What they may do is push hard to get to, to, to animals of their own kind to be with their herd mates. What they will definitely do is push hard to get back inside if the weather's too hot, too cold or too wet. Um, but equally, they will push to go outside for thermoregulation purposes. And, and I think all that sort of research will inform better design of facilities, better design of systems. Um, but it gives us more insight into the what what truly motivates an animal and what that animal actually is seeking to do rather than our perceptions of what they might have done in the wild. I would agree yeah that's and actually you'd be pleased to know not all that work happened in British Columbia some of it happened right here in the UK as well. <laughs> Fair enough. Carmen are you anything to add? No fine okay so no thank you that's okay so um, there's lots of questions coming um, through. A lot of them are linked, so I'm going to try and sort of pull them together and, and take us down one of two ways. So I think the conversations we're having, we seem to be kind of switching between health and welfare and productivity and, and you know, going around, around the edges of the difficulties we have. Um, and I'd just like to come back to this, this, especially Carmen, you brought up this feeding the global population. Um, I think um, it was mentioned that where there's an increase in efficiency, there's a decrease in price and therefore an increase in demand, which potentially is leading to lower welfare. So I guess my, my question here is, do we need more intensive systems to feed the world? When we take into account the levels of food waste we have as well, is this a conversation that we need to be having about systems or do we need to, to look at sustainability in the wider context in terms of food availability? Who would like to go first? Okay. Can I just say a few things? Yes, I do think that we need to look uh, um, in a more integrated way at everything. And to me, I always think it, everything has to be in balance. And we also need to think that if we, um, whatever we will do in one area will affect something else. And we need to think also to discuss about the different trades off between you know the different as I said the different pillars of sustainability uh, sustainability is very very complex and looking at other all the research we are doing around everybody talks about sustainability and sometimes I wonder do actually we know what do we mean by that of course we go back to the initial definition um, but uh, uh, I feel that somehow we we, we are following, we are following with we are uh, the, the fashionable words, you know, everything has to be sustainable, uh, but how do we define really sustainable and what that means, you know, from an animal welfare point of view, I think that for me it's very, very, very important, but I still think we can do, we can feed the world, but as I said, we need to think about how we all behave, and it's in, in a way, David pointed out very well at some point that, that uh, difference between the citizen and consumer gap dilemma. We are all talking about you know, animal welfare, but are we indeed you know, prepared to help, to, to help uh, this happening? 
So it is in a way also the lack of account uh, accountability. Why we always have to argue that is the government who has to be responsible for everything. Of course, the government is the guardian of animal welfare, as you know, as or, or, of animals as we define them in the animal farm animal welfare committee some time ago. But it's us all who have to have uh, responsibility for everything where we're doing, including you know wasting our food or including you know you know switching off lights, uh, thinking about life and how we treat animals. And just going back, you know what happened during the pandemic when everybody you know was excited about buy, buying a lot of of, uh, of of pets. And what's going on now? You know when people you know you know a, a, a puppy will become a big dog and it needs different different needs. So. I think we will need to rethink about the way how we think of how we approach everything, uh, even with with us. But I said uh, for me is balance and everything. Do we need a one system? I still don't think I understand what. For me, it's not clear what is intensive and what is extensive at this moment. Because from if we look at all the definition we define, people just think it's a lot of animals in one place. Jimmy. Yeah, uh, uh, it's such a great question, such a complicated one as well. But I mean, when we look at things, definitions like sustainability, food security, carrying capacity, one health, they all come back down to the same basic pillars of, uh, of ideas. And do we need intensification? Well, I, I said you, there's good evidence from FAO that uh, approximately one billion people worldwide rely on, on fish as their major source of protein, and most of them are not getting enough of it. Now, the waste issue is, 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 a third, is a first world problem. If you go to countries like Bangladesh, nothing's wasted. It's very tidy because everything is recycled. People don't have any resources. You drop a banana skin, somebody will pick it up and feed it to their goat. There's tremendous um, recycling in those sorts of less privileged environments. And, but the people need more food. And they don't just need more carbohydrates, they need more proteins and, and, and lipids, especially young children and pregnant nursing mothers and stuff like this. And aquaculture is one of the main sources, as I say, for more than a billion people, but it's currently not fulfilling demand. There's no excess production in fisheries. It's got to come from somewhere. So, all right, maybe there's, there's a different balance in first world countries, but in a lot of underprivileged countries uh, actually in some form of sustainable productive intensification is essential to give people something to eat. Can I just come back on that? I mean I, I think I don't think there's a lot of argument around that really. I mean I think that again that falls into the idea of that some aspects of intensification at the early stages are what is needed often and that often you know that my Indian cow example was really an example of how the welfare of those animals was immeasurably better than the, the stray cows on the streets of Delhi who get hit by cars and eat plastic bags and, and tend to, to have short and not very pleasant lives. Um, but I think also, I think within this, you know, I think there's, I think um, there was a, a comment that, that, you know, animal welfare is really a first world problem. And I would completely disagree with that. I've done quite a lot of work in Asia and um, it's a problem, it's a concern for, for communities there as well. It's not something that just, ex no, I don't think that's what you said, Jimmy. I oh, think it's something you. that was said earlier <laughs> that um, the animal welfare was just a sort of luxury of a well-fed population. And that's not, that's not the case that I've seen in the countries that I've been to. There's a lot of concern for the lives of animals as well. David, did you want to come in here? Absolutely. And and I think it was, it was I was the, uh, the, the originator of that comment that, that, that welfare, and I didn't mean to say that welfare is a first world problem, uh, but it's certainly, um, if you use the adage that, that excuse me, my, my dog's kicking off, um, that uh, a, a well-fed man has many problems, a hungry man has only one. We have addressed hunger, we are increasingly addressing addressing hunger, which is, is um, as human beings is probably our, our overriding has been our overriding objective through most of history. Um, we are now in a privileged position to be able to possibly devote more resources um, to to addressing other other aspects of, of animal husbandry, and we are doing that. The industry is doing that, and and 
I would reiterate what I said a few moments ago that that selection criteria now across the majority of species have a much greater weighting towards delivering health and welfare outcomes than they did 10, 15 or even 20 years ago. Um, so we, in answer to the question, do we need more intensive systems? No, what we need is more equitable, resource efficient and welfare focused systems. But that doesn't mean we have to forfeit productivity as a consequence. So, Jimmy, did I did I interrupt you before? Were you wanting to come in before? No, I, I was just making sure that Cathy didn't say uh, didn't suggest that uh, I was saying that uh, welfare is a first world problem. That that was all. Cathy, uh, then Carmen. I just I, I mean it depends what Carmen wants to talk. I was wondering where we were moving on to thinking about genetics and genomics because I would really like to address that at some point yeah, and its yeah. relationship to welfare. I just want to reiterate what exactly what David was saying because this was my last point. Uh, when you ask about, you know, what do we need? And for me, you know, my last point was that for, uh, to consider genu a genuinely sustainable strategy, I always think we need to be able, or farmers need, need to be able to produce in a resource efficient, animal welfare friendly, environmental sound, and competitive way. And competitive way, you know, we just can't say, okay, because uh, the others, uh, they are doing uh, not as well as we, you know, we can stop imports. I just don't think that's really the case. We need to think about all these things. And that's what I said. It's very complex. And I will let you, Kate, to talk about genomics. I, I didn't want, in a way, to bring, you know, to Jimmy protein in terms of protein, maybe thinking about insects, but probably this is a different discussion. So, um, Kathy, before we come to you, there's actually a question related to this. So, Nairi has said, measures of production are not measures of welfare. The genetic push for high production surely means that it will happen despite the welfare state. Before you answer that, just to the audience, we've only got about five minutes left. So, if you, while you're listening, if you could just go to the Slido tab, upvote the question there that you like the most, and I'll try and get to the most popular one next as our closing question. Kathy. Yeah, that question was was absolutely bang on. I mean, I think nearly 60 years ago now, the Bramble Committee explicitly rejected that. So we've known for a very long time that productivity is not a good measure of welfare. And, you know, that's never been part of, um, well, it should not be part of our thinking. Um, and I think really what, I mean, yes, I absolutely agree with you, David, that now at least for dairy cows and maybe a little bit for, for some of the other species, they're starting to be more, uh, less single trait selection and including more health and welfare traits in that. I think my more cynical view is the geneticists are finally getting around to fixing some of the problems they created in the first place through genetic selection. So, um, so that I'm not sure I would present that as a good thing rather than it's just fixing the problems genetics created. And I just wanted to, I know Jimmy wants to come back on this and maybe the fish story is different, but my good friend, Professor Malcolm Mitchell, who might be known to some of you, has tells it you know birds are amazing they can fly over the andes they can migrate from one end of the country to the other a man's greatest achievement is to is to create the broiler chicken that can do nothing at all except grow and uh, have lots of welfare problems so you know geneticists is an amazing tool but we want to be really really careful about what we do with it um, because i think most of our a lot of our problems in intensive systems have actually come to some extent or other through the genetic selection. And even, you know, the issue with, with dairy cows wanting to be inside and eating their TMR ration is really because they're on a metabolic knife edge and they can't live outside. And I, because they can't get enough nutrition outside in the grass. And we see that reduction in body condition score in cows that are on grazing systems. And that for me is really concerning that how we interpret that data is not that well, the animals wanted to be inside. We've selected them to the point where they can't live outside sometimes. Um, David and then Jimmy? I wouldn't disagree with that, Cathy, uh, uh, but I would counter it with, um, unfortunately, the 8 billion people argument that, that there are 8 billion people on this planet, that population is rising. We need, and, and we have done what we have done over, over centuries. Um, and yes, I think the industry is absolutely conscious of, of the mistakes that's been made in the past. And I think that, that there's a huge effort being made now to, to, to address that and to improve that. So um, we are in a, um, we have a number of targets that we need, we need to hit. I, I stressed at the beginning that, you know, food affordability, food supply to, to the growing world population is probably the most fundamental of those because without that, everything else starts to become a moot point because society will start to break down 
fastest when when food shortages become an issue and we're in a very fortunate position where where we don't recognize a world of, of food shortages and that allows us to focus better in which we are doing on delivering those elements that of, of, of animal welfare that, that are absolutely fundamentally important david if i may just on that um would you agree however because it comes back to kathy's comment um earlier about the fact that you know food food shortages and, and, and does, don't exist in the UK necessarily. P food poverty is a different conversation, but food shortages and food waste is, is something else. And I, I believe in 2017, um, the average lactations at exit from a herd of a UK dairy cow was less than four. Now, I, that to me suggests we still do have a lot of work to do, even to meet those welfare targets in the UK where we don't necessarily have that pressure in terms of food, the volume of food production. Would you agree we still have work to do? I think, yes, it's, a, it, it's, an, ongoing, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, I think you need to be careful with, with lactation numbers at, at herd exit. A lot of those are economic decisions um, rather, than, rather than welfare decisions. And I think looking at, at involuntary culling criteria is probably a more um, relevant, um, uh, relevant statistic than, than simple replacement rate. And certainly, if I go back to the, the 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 figures I quoted, that a lot of these very well managed, high output herds, and I'm, I will shy away from using intensive. These are very well managed and consequently high output herds, show much lower than average levels of involuntary culling, and that's purely down to management. Jimmy, yeah, thank you. And I, I mean, I think Kathy. We completely agree with Cathy's point that productivity is not a measure of welfare. But sometimes people kind of turn that argument around slightly and suggest that increased productivity means bad welfare. And that's not the case either. What we should be looking for is the sweet spot where we get good productivity and good welfare, uh, efficient, sustainable uses of resources, which also provides good welfare. And, and I think we need to be careful not to turn the productivity doesn't equal welfare argument round about and, and use it as an inverse relationship. Any other question? Any other comments from the panelists at all? Okay. Well, come go ahead. To say yeah. Maybe people could go back to the machinery <laughs> frontier and see exactly where you know where the, what the point is between uh productivity productivity in animal welfare but uh, it seems like we're going all the time with the basic machinery for machinery yes thank you carmen so um the most popular question i think we've already touched on really in our conversation so um i'm now going to uh, challenge the panelists because i'm going to give you each a minute please uh, just a minute because we're going to run out of time just to to sum up your your arguments either for or against the motion before we go back to the audience to vote to see if we have a change in how people are feeling so um david could i come to you first certainly um so i'd like to say uh, number one affordable and secure food supply is a fundamental of a safe equitable and prosperous society sustainably feeding eight nine ten billion people requires pragmatic economically viable and cost-effective solutions aesthetics and anthropomorphism I will maintain are not reliable proxies for sustainability or objective welfare provision. What consumers demand or, or aspire to and what they're prepared to pay for are often, or can afford to pay for, are often two very different things. And therefore contemporary livestock production, uh, the livestock industry is continually evolving to address these multiple objectives. And I think he's making progress on that front. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Carmen? Uh, yeah, I uh, agree with that. Thanks, David. Uh, for me, I think uh, what is important is still to, un to define what do we mean by intensive, extensive, and all other uh, you know, systems of production. We don't really know what it is. I would like to see uh, that that disconnect between uh, farmers, and, uh, and the larger public uh, somehow uh, reduced because I think we need all to learn where our food comes from, but also we need to think that farmers need to be supported. 
Um, and uh, I also, as I said, I take the fact, uh, I would like to re reinforce that intensification is not the same as efficiency. And I give you, you know, I already gave you the example of the, the Australian beef production. And for, for me overall, I always think that if we want to move on, we need to think about uh, resource efficiency, animal welfare friendly environment, also, we should think about how we, uh, how we care about the environment and also to think about that uh, everything has to be done also um, in a balance and uh, uh, a competitive, in a competitive way. Thank you very much, Carmen. Jimmy? Thank you. Um, I think we've demonstrated that intensification can be good for sustainability and welfare. And we need to be very careful of the argument that intensification always leads to bad welfare. Seven years ago, coming back to something Cathy said, we took the entire BVA council to a bunch of fish farms on the west coast of Scotland, and they were astonished by the quality of care on those farms. So I think intensification can be good for welfare and sustainability. Not invariably, but it can be. And Kathy. Thanks. Most of the animals that we farm are uh, vertebrates, and we now believe or understand those animals to be sentient. In these systems, then, is it really acceptable to put animals in carrying crates, which still happens, in confinement, in cages? We have high levels of lameness in our dairy cattle, our broiler, and our pig sectors. We still carry out tail docking, beak trimming, castration, nearly always without anaesthetic or analgesics. So these are the ways that we are treating sentient animals. Now we can make all sorts of arguments about how we need to feed a world population, but there are lots of other alternatives. So we've mentioned insects, we've thought about food waste, we've looked at the inequities of how we distribute our food. So with that being the case, I, it's really hard to see how we can accept these practices. And now these are practices of intensification. Um, I haven't really talked much about aquaculture. I'm not really an expert in that area, but I would like to ask Jimmy how removing the eye of a prawn improves their welfare, which is what happens in intensive agriculture or for prawn species, or, or you know, nobody's mentioned sea lice, which I think is obviously a big issue for, for salmon farming. I don't want to open a can of sea lice um, for another, another debate, but um, I think there are still lots and lots of unacceptable, I think what most people would consider to be unacceptable ways of behaving that are unethical towards sentient animals. If we truly believe that, then we need to fix those problems first. Jimmy, given that that was a direct question to you, do you want, do you want to answer? In the meantime, everybody, if you could just have a look um, at the poll section on your screen, we have put the motion back up again. And if you could um, start voting there, we'll see how things have changed. Jimmy. Um, removing the eyes of, of prawns is, is widely considered to be a fairly grim practice and is, is being phased out. Um, uh, a lot of the, the, the retailers now insist that the prawns are produced without the removal of eyes, so no problem. Sea lice, really big issue. We should have probably covered it earlier. Uh, sea lice levels are lowest, or well, first of all, sea lice are a problem of wild fish as well as farm fish. They've, they've, they've always been there. Uh, levels are now at the lowest level for the last 10 years. Um, uh, and Last year, only 15% of salmon farms had to use chemical treatments for sea, farm, uh, for sea lice. So it, the intensification is giving the resources to control the problem. Thank you, Jimmy. Right. So um, if everybody could uh, head over to the polls, I, I'm just watching it shift. There has been a slight difference from when we started this. And just a reminder, the motion is intensive farming is good for welfare and sustain sustainability. So if you could head over there and let us know what you think. So when the last poll finished earlier, we were about 80% disagree and 20% agree. We've had a slight shift, um, I would say, uh, with, whoo, it keep, keeps going. We're heading 70 to 73% disagree and the rest agreeing. I think what I would sum up in this uh, of this um, discussion and debate is that I don't think there are any straight answers. I think it depends how you define intensification. I think it depends on whether your priority lies with health or welfare, or whether you fundamentally believe they're intrinsically linked. I think it also slightly depends on what part of the world you're talking about, because 
you know, where is food, where are food shortages happening and where is food waste happening? So in summary, I think there's um, a lot to digest there, probably a lot for the audience members to take away, perhaps think about their own decisions when it comes to the purchasing of food, for example. Um, and um, I would just like to thank the four speakers who were brilliant, who have come up this, I don't think from completely polar opposite ends, we've just asked them to come in and debate the polar opposite. So I would just like to thank you all for all your hard work um, and thank you to the audience for your engagement. And I think we're now handing over to my fellow trustee, um, Fiona Fell, to talk about some AWF funded research.